Hey there, folks. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Today is Wednesday, October 8th, and we're going to focus on an area in Iceland outside the Reykjanes Peninsula where we've mainly been focused our attention for the past few years with the on and off volcanic eruptions from the earthquake swarms and that sort of thing. And we're going to look at an area that's been experiencing some pretty intense uh, earthquake activity for the past year or so and even going back maybe about three or four years ago and there's a new Met Office update that shed some light on what they're doing there. Uh, the Icelandic government and public officials are clearly concerned about what may take place there. Uh, nothing too alarming but an area of concern so I thought we'd spend some time looking at a new region in Iceland that warrants some attention from us geologically. So the area I'm focused on here, here's Reykjavik, you can see the roadway systems here in Western Iceland, lies north of the capital area a few hours. And this is known as the Griotarvat uh, earthquake swarm. And it's part of a bigger volcanic system known as the Liosofjalt uh, system. And I'm probably butchering the terms learning some new words there but this is approximately the location where we've been seeing the earthquake activity just to get you oriented it lies at the eastern end of the Snæfellsnes peninsula here this prominent east-west trending peninsula in western Iceland so let's go right to that Met Office update and I have some things I want to share with you to show you just what's been going on so this is a Met Office update from October 6 just a few days ago and it seems like they had a, a big uh, meeting in maybe in August or so about this area. And so they've shared some of the information here. There's even a link to the uh, proceedings from this meeting, all, all in Icelandic. So you'd need to translate that if you don't uh, speak Icelandic or have means to translate it. Uh, but this is the area we're looking at here. You can see some of the earthquake activity here. Um, the earthquakes, you know, literally thousands of earthquakes have been going on there for the past year or so none of which have been greater than about magnitude three and a half i think 3.7 might be the biggest one they've had so far but they're big enough that people have felt them in the area and of course being in iceland of course the big question is are these earthquakes and all this intense earthquake activity is it tied to uh, some magmatic movements like we saw near Grindavik with the eruptions on the Reykjanes Peninsula. Remember back in 2023, we had very intense earthquake activity, much higher in magnitude, magnitude fives even, um, shaking the ground, causing damage to some of the homes in Grindavik, and then ultimately culminating in an eruption that began in December of 2023. And those eruptions have continued on and off since then. So similar concern is being expressed here for this area of Iceland. for Luckily, the area in question is pretty uh, uninhabited. You can kind of see where the roadways plot up here. This is the region in question. So even if we were to have an eruption somewhere in this area, the impacts on you know any communities or infrastructure, at least at this point, look to be pretty minimal. This is an area where the we've had eruptions in the past, but they typically haven't been very large. Of course, this all lies off of the plate boundary, but along this sort of east-west trending known volcanic region. So we do have volcanic eruptions here over the past few uh, you know, centuries and even thousands of years ago. So it's not an area completely uh, off the map in terms of volcanic eruptions. But let's go ahead and get back to that Met Office update. Again, just kind of hitting some of the highlights here, and I'll put the link to this under the video description. So the biggest takeaway from their meeting, uh, trying to uh, I guess probably quell some of the fears from locals and others is that there's just no indication that there's magma movement near the surface. They're not seeing any ground deformation from GPS measurements and other ways of detecting uh, movement of the ground. They're just not seeing that yet. Um, and again, this was a meeting back in August with residents and other probably stakeholders in the region. They brought in experts to present their information. Uh, can't make these any bigger really i guess i could try making them a little bit bigger this way but this is a plot of um we have three graphs here all kind of tied together across the the x-axis here we have time so this starts in about august of 2024 so about a year ago goes up to uh current times so about october of 2025 basically each little tick mark is or is a month-long period and this just shows the magnitude of the earthquake so you can see the number and magnitude of quakes occurring in this area. There's been some definitely some more intense periods where earthquakes have been more frequent, times when there's been a little bit more elevated 
uh, earthquakes. There's those three high ones there, about magnitude 3.7. Uh, and then you can see that, you know, just that thick cluster of black basically over the past few months. The middle one here shows us earthquakes over that same period of time with respect to depth. So you can see most of the earthquakes are happening in that sort of 15 to 20 or so kilometer range. That seems to be the bulk of the earthquake activity. And that's a pretty deep level as compared to something we saw in Gurindavik. And so this you know, leads us to believe that you know, it may be magma that's producing the earthquakes, but that magma body just hasn't shown any signs yet of coming closer to the surface. It seems to be staying down there in that sort of uh, deeper crustal level of about 15 to 20 kilometers. So as of yet, we're not seeing any indications that the magma is moving upwards. A few earthquakes that were shallower, but again, the bulk of the earthquakes in that deeper range there. And then the final graph here shows total number of earthquakes per month. So you can see it kind of ramping up here late in 2024 early into 2025, bit of a lull here in the spring. Uh, but since the summertime, it's been pretty high with anywhere from about maybe 200 to 400 or so earthquakes per month. Uh, so that's kind of the data that we've been looking at so far. Again, no sign of land rise. So there's no indication that the land is actually moving upwards. And that's something we typically would see and have seen in one of these systems if a volcanic eruption was uh, developing. If something like that was going to take place, we would expect to see those earthquakes getting shallower, the ground deforming above that magma body that's now moved into the shallow parts of the subsurface. And we're just not seeing that so far. Um, so just no, either from INSAR data or GPS data, no land uplift has been measured so far. But again, they say here, this does not rule out the possibility, possibility that magma is present at great depths. Again, we're looking at earthquakes that are so deep down there that it's hard to tell for sure exactly what's generating those earthquakes. And we'll look at that here in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, another just sort of a, a cross section here, you know, just sort of showing maybe there's some magma accumulating below the subsurface, again, at that 15 to 20 kilometer depth that's producing these earthquakes here. Uh, then they go on f with the meeting there and some of their experts in um, postulating, I suppose, three different possible scenarios. So three outcomes that are likely to occur from given this current state of affairs. So first scenario is just magma accumulation stops, just whatever magma is accumulating at that depth stops, it solidifies, and the earthquakes basically drop off considerably over time. Second scenario is the activity increases and becomes more shallow so basically okay we're picking up more earthquakes over time and now we might in the future start seeing ground deformation indications that the magma is moving closer to the surface and then the third one there which would be you know sort of the at one end of the spectrum i suppose is that the magma reaches the surface and actually causes an eruption um, lava flows could reach up to 30 kilometers from the source uh, gas pollution and gas uh, from the, with the wind would reach up to maybe 200 kilometers from the site, depending on exactly how the weather is going there. Uh, and then they go on to put forward, based on that third scenario, so if an eruption were to take place, where would it occur? And again, this is a little bit fuzzy, and it's not their original um, uh, graphic here, so I can't really uh, click on this and make it any bigger. But basically looking at four different areas, in the area there's these different drainages and maybe I'll, I'll i'll try to go to actually this is a good way to look at it here let's go to this map here so this map here in this site with the icelandic volcanoes nicely shows the uh, craters and the lavas that erupted during the last eruption here uh, and i'd have to look up exactly when that occurred i believe it was you know centuries ago uh, last eruption was yeah about tenths 10th century or so from this system. So here's some of the mapped lava flows here. And you can see that these lava flows are largely in these valleys. Let me see if I can get that a little bit better for you. You can see they're, they're occupying these valleys between these ridges. That's what these lava flows shown in purple are here. And so, you know, likelihood is that you might get an eruption in any one of these four valleys. They're all different sort of drainage basins, uh, hydrologic systems. So the, the, Lava from these eruptions would largely be confined to these valleys, uh, traveling to the north and to the south to some degree. Again, but you know, 
not likely um, or lower, I guess, probability that they would really impact roadways and infrastructure. Again, depending on exactly where those took place. Um, getting back to the update there, so they designate those sort of four possible areas and those valleys where the lava flows could uh, take place. Um, they recognize lots of uncertainty. Uncertainty is high. The scenario could subside, but it can continue on for years. So we might have this earthquake activity go on for several more years, and we might not get an eruption. That's actually pretty common is to have these subsurface events um, accompanied with earthquake activity, magma movement, maybe it's accumulating, but it doesn't really lead to an eruption. Uh, and they compare that to a couple known instances in Iceland in 2007 and in 1996, where they had deep magma accumulation, but no uh, surface eruption. Um, they do go on to say that eruptions in this specific volcanic system are considered to be fairly small by Icelandic sour standards, and the effects are pretty localized. So not, again, looking for something, you know, shutting down air traffic in Europe or you know, lava flows like at the airport, like we see on the Reykjanes Peninsula. And then finally, the last part of this very long and detailed but uh, very exceptional update is looking at the comparison between what we've seen on the Reykjanes Peninsula and the Snifelsnes Peninsula, that these are different systems and they erupt differently. Of course, we know the Reykjanes uh, Peninsula has the active plate boundary system, so we have fissure eruptions there. We have structural controls in the rocks, faults and fractures that go hand in hand with those volcanic eruptions and, and, and exert a very uh, dominant control over them. Here in the Snifelsnes Peninsula, there's not as much of that uh, fissure um, activity as we see in other places. Uh, no connection between the two systems. I think that's an important point to make that even what we have going on here in this area is not connected to what's happening there near Grindavik. And that the eruptions on this system um, are a lot fewer. So there's a lot less activity. This is not a very active system when you look at the data as compared to the Reykjanes Peninsula or other portions of Iceland, uh, especially closer to that plate boundary. So some interesting information there. Uh, and again, just the maps here uh, are good, but they're a little fuzzy and it's hard. They, they're not enlarging when you click on them, so you can't really uh, get them larger. And then at the end, if you're interested, they do have uh, a link or embedded video here to that resident meeting uh, that you can check out. Again, it is all in Icelandic. So that's the idea here. I wanted to show you um, another bit of information here related to this. So here's the last week or so with the earthquakes. And we'll start down here where we're familiar, the area north of Grindavik, not seeing a lot of earthquakes at all over the past week. Little cluster here that we've been seeing that's been fairly persistent in the Krishuvik system near Lake Klevravat. And then the area we're talking about here, which is further to the north, this is the last week or so, uh, the earthquake activity. You can see the one big blue dot there. That's that 3.5 that occurred on October 2nd. So you can see there's still earthquake activity going on in this region over the past week. And then I also pulled up all the earthquakes over the past year. So basically from October 2024, up to October 2025. Um, and so you can nicely delineate the, the plate boundary running through Iceland. That's where we see most of the earthquake and seismic activity. Um, you can look at it all coming right through Grindavik, that clear dike that we've talked out before, talked about before, uh, the, the quakes that have gone on over here in the Krishivik system. But again, this is the area that's been somewhat anomalous. I mean, if you really had to predict before this all began like okay where's the next big seismic cluster of quakes going to be in iceland of course you would have you know mainly picked the active plate boundaries in the known uh, volcanic systems here so this is a bit of a surprise to see this uh intensity of seismic activity that's persisted for this amount of time so there's all the earthquakes over the past year uh looks like we got a 3.5 that's that one from october 2nd and then if you zoom in here and start looking at these individually, you can start to see, um, you know, a few of the, the the ones that are of comparable size. But mostly there's a 3.7 right there, but everything under 3.7. So not really large earthquakes. And again, fairly deep. This one's 18 kilometers down, um, but really interesting, this uh, cluster of earthquakes here. Um, we can also see one last thing, I suppose, here 
is looking at, uh, and I, I almost want to like head out there next time I'm in Iceland, although I don't know how accessible this area is, but the bedrock here, especially to the east of the area, uh, has these interesting, there's definitely a structural control that runs uh, kind of northwest, southeast. You can see these fracture systems running through the terrain here. There's also a secondary set of fractures that runs uh, sort of at 90 degrees or orthogonal to that. Uh, but it's even exerting a really pronounced control over the stream systems. Look at some of these crazy stream systems that have these like right angle turns to them. So in this wetland area here where we have these lakes, there are streams that are connecting some of these lakes and they're following this very pronounced fracture pattern that runs in this sort of northwest, southeast direction uh, and this sort of secondary structural trend here that runs more kind of east, I guess, uh, north, northeast to, I guess, south, southwest. Uh, but pretty interesting geometries to the, these here. I'm assuming these are like older basalts, but I don't know. Um, but it'd be interesting to look at these structures in a little bit more detail. And again, this is, you know, just to the southeast of where we're seeing the main uh, cluster of earthquakes around these lakes over here. So just wanted to catch you up to date with that new Met Office update and uh, show you some of the data here. Again, just to reiterate, we're not expecting this to become another volcano at this point. There's no data to support that. Right now, it's a very interesting set of earthquakes that's taken place over the past year. Fairly low magnitude, but uh, quite a few of them. So pretty high frequency of quakes happening in this largely... Uh, rural part of Iceland. Uh, if we were to have an eruption here, this is the kind of place that it would be pretty ideal because it keeps, for the most part, it would stay away from most of the infrastructure, homes, residences, and such. So we'll continue to watch this area with interest uh, over the next few uh, weeks, months, maybe years, depending on how this goes on, goes on for. And we'll also keep you up to date with the uh, things that are going on further to the south where we do expect uh, some sort of event to take place here soon, uh, here northeast of Grindavik on the Sunukur uh, crater system here, now down on the Reykjanes Peninsula. Thanks for your attention and time today. Appreciate your support of the channel, and we'll see you next time. Take care.